Okay. I'll go first since I, my name's listed there first. Um, I am Claudia. I am the Youth Services Librarian at the Homer Public Library, um, which means that I work through with um, kids and teens zero to 18 and their families. I manage um, both the juvenile and young adult collections, um, summer reading program, all of the uh, programs for those ages. And Julie asked us to talk just briefly about what our philosophy is about kind of measurements and assessment and evaluation. And I have been thinking a lot about that in kind of this new environment. And you know, my philosophy is that it isn't just about the stats, the numbers. Um, we really want to understand what families in my community need and want as well as demonstrate how we're serving our community. So thinking about the different audiences, you know, what resources are people looking for in this new social environment? What services are resonating? And we're kind of using stats and other methods of measuring success to create that story or picture, which you may have heard before, but we're kind of really putting it into play. Um, a story that will help staff and decision makers kind of plan and iterate and target limited resources like staff time and collection development dollars while keeping staff in the community safe. So that's kind of uh, my philosophy going into this conversation. Elizabeth, I think you're next. I'm next on the list. I'm Elizabeth Nikolai. I'm the Youth Services Coordinator of the Anchorage Public Library. We have five locations and I get to coordinate services across all of them and supervise our librarians here at the main location, LUSAC. And we have eight, um, we were served birth to 18. Um, and then one of the things that sort of we approached as we looked at, our philosophy always with statistics is to measure outputs and outcomes. So outputs are 60 people attended story times. Outcomes are in the parent survey afterward, 80% um, of the caregivers said that they are more likely to sing as an early literacy method at home because of attending story time. So we're really interested in outputs and outcomes, and we've worked a ton on them in the last few years, and really we had a whole sorts of great new plans we were about to put in place um, after spring break, which of course did not happen. And um, so as we're moving forward, um, we're pretty good about knowing how many people attended a virtual story time or took a program to go packet and we're really really looking on the outcomes and changes and that is um, an ever evolving discussion but that is and that as Claudia says that helps us tell the story um, and then one of the things that we're also really really concerned about is um, equity diversion and equity diversity and inclusion and we know a lot of the virtual resources and other resources that have come out have a big middle class bias. They're like, here's a fun activity. I assume you have glue sticks and all of this stuff at home. And so we're really trying to make sure our programs are accessible and provide supplies. And we really are looking for ways to measure how it's doing in communities that can't pop online and fill out a survey for us because they don't have those resources or those English language skills. So I don't have all the answers, but that's the questions we're asking. Is, is Sarah on? I, I don't know. Sarah, are you on? Okay, looks like there might, she might not be. Sorry. So folks, we, we need everybody to mute themselves if you're not uh, speaking so, um, so we don't get that feedback. Um, okay, so Susan, do you just want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I'm Susan Jones. Um, I'm the Youth Services Librarian in Fairbanks. Um, for many years, uh, I myself uh, was the, the, the main librarian that covered both birth up to um, 18, but um, about a year or so ago, um, we added a young adult librarian um, that position is presently being recruited for um, right now. Um, we have our main Fairbanks branch, the Norween Library, and a branch in North Pole, the North Pole branch. Um, and 
um, when I am I'm not thinking um, COVID thoughts um, and I'm trying to think what assessment and evaluation mean, um, uh, my first thing is just survival, but that's not really the, the right word to use um, in this particular case. So um, I like to think of evaluation and assessment as um, looking at sort of the big picture. It's, it, it's somewhat numbers, but um, also um, a whole bunch more information about um, using resources and um, what people tell us about their behavior. Um, if they do tell us, um, or what they, um, how they walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to hearing other people's um, determination of how they consider evaluation and assessment um, in this conversation. Great, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move the slide here. And we are going to try something new. So in the chat box is a link to Minty.com. If you have a, if you have a um, cell phone or a smartphone or whatever, and you put in, uh, go to that Minty.com website and put in the code, then you can um, share on our word cloud. And I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen now so we can see as people enter uh, the one word that describes how they feel about evaluation. Um, we should be able to see what everybody is doing there. And Julie, it does work on um, browser-based. If you don't have a smartphone, you can open a new tab in your browser. Okay, great. So I see a word. Can people, are people entering? Because I'm not sure. <laughs> this is my... Oh, great. I see more words. Awesome. Can everybody see this? Right. We'll just give it um, like a couple, two minutes, three minutes. Might help out with the conversation. I'm oh, guessing that's an interesting word. Helpful, future looking, door to the future, overwhelming, unprepared, stakeholders. Okay, we'll give it one more minute um, for folks that just entered. Usefulness question mark. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing here. And for um, if folks wanted to, they could share also in the chat um, if there's a they wanted to share that way. Okay, and let's go to um, these were the topics um, for this, this. These topics for discussions came out of the um, ALSCs. Managing Children's Services Program evaluation training that they offer 
And I believe the instructors for that training are Laura Koenig and Amanda Yother. And they offer a training that explores methods to evaluate library pro programs that will take you beyond attendance numbers and surveys. And the course will help you look at ways to gather meaningful feedback from both children and caregivers. But we kind of had um, a discussion about these questions and we thought they were a good jumping off point. So I'm gonna let the panelists just share. They can choose any of these questions or uh, topics. Um, to speak to, and then of course you are encouraged to ask questions or share comments as well. So I'm going to mute myself and let uh, the panelists begin, and um, we'll let you guys decide who goes first. <laughs> well, um, I can jump in. This is Susan in Fairbanks um, because this is something that I'm looking at a lot right now. The question of how are you evaluating virtual programs? Um, so we're doing sort of a combination of um, Facebook. Um, we did a few live, um, some recorded, and then we've done some Zoom stuff. Um, and because I am not a Facebook poster myself, I'm looking at um, uh, the statistics, if you will, that you can accumulate for um, videos that you've put on Facebook and trying to find something that actually is meaningful um, to try to determine who's actually watching them um, because there's all sorts of kinds of um, statistics. You can get real live people who watched it for one minute, 10 seconds, three seconds, an average watch. Um, you know, just because somebody is showing on their computer that they're watching it, does that represent one person? Does it represent a family of 10? Um, every time you click because your internet went down and you have to look at it again, does that count as a Another view, um, I just find it all incredibly um, confusing in a, in a sense, um, and I'm wondering how other people are interpreting, in particular, Facebook statistics. Hi, Susan. Um, this is Elizabeth. Hello. We are doing story time two days a week on um, Facebook. And uh, we're about to cut that down because our numbers are falling. But we are using one minute views for our attendance count. We had a conversation about potentially doubling those because we do know that parents and children or caregivers and children often watch a screen together. Um, but we haven't right now in the actual report, like our spreadsheet with numbers. But when I write up my narrative, I said, we know that so many screens viewed for at least one minute, which eliminates the number of people who did like three seconds on autoplay as they scrolled past. Um, and we can extrapolate that that was a minimum of, and then we doubled that number. Um, we do, the demographic information that's there, we've used it some, and um, we found exactly what we expected. Our highest percentage watched was from women ages 30 to 45, which correlates with primary caregivers primarily being women in about that age group. Um, so that's the, how we're using it. Um, and we're also following engagements with likes and shares. Um, we haven't asked directly for feedback and that's what we've been wrestling with is tossing in the comments uh, a link to a survey or it would be effective or not. Thanks. I will follow up with one, one more question that it sort of has to do with evaluating virtual programs, but it, it's sort of something that's on my mind all the time when I think of anything online, um, is how to determine um, if there is any of um, digital fatigue um, out there by anybody, um, children, adults, um, parents, caregivers. Um, I know Early on, when our library closed, um, I got a call from said, um, you know, I, I want some books, how can I get them? And at that point in time, we weren't doing curbside or anything. And I said, you know, I, I, we don't have any, I can't get them to you right now, you know, but here's all these digital options. And, and she pretty much terminated the conversation by saying, well, I only want physical books for my child. I guess I'll go to the grocery store. Um, so um, that was, that was one representation of, um, 
not wanting to do electronic stuff. I don't know that that was necessarily digital fatigue, but um, I know myself sometimes just you, you use your phone, you're on the computer, you go home, you're checking things all the time. And um, to make what we're doing stand out because what so many of our staff have mentioned is they want that one-on-one -on -one kind of contact and they're finding that hard to get from a virtual program. This is Claudia and Homer. I am not doing virtual story times. I'm doing um, radio story times. So I won't speak to that in particular, but I am doing other virtual programs, um, particularly for a little bit older than the traditional like preschool story time audience. And we are learning a lot. Some of them I'm leading and doing the tech for on my own. And some of them I'm doing the tech for someone else who's actually presenting the content. And one of our kind of goals of all of these virtual youth programs, even some of the virtual adult programs, is to not only support family engagement, but create that connection, that, it, that it's really important in how we set up the program. So for example, in an American Sign Language Club for kids seven to 10, we encourage siblings, we encourage families to participate, but we're kind of making space for kids who uh, are kind of working out the tech, working out this new kind of social dynamic. Um, and some of the kind of cool things that we've noticed is that with kids basically, you know, they're in their house or even in their bedroom, that they're actually very comfortable participating and signing because they don't, feel maybe on stage as they might in the library. But we're also having to kind of pause and kind of set the parameters on what the conversation looks like in, in a Zoom setting. Um, and so that's, that's very different. But because we have low numbers, we're actually able to kind of figure out what we want the expectation to be to support families. And I've been doing a very small group coding program for about two months with some middle school kids. And they have like complete ownership over the program at this point. Um, we kind of shift back and forth about how we run the session, the weekly sessions. Um, and some days we're all totally frustrated. And some days we all want to jump up on the, on the roof and shout what we've all accomplished. Um, and so I'm kind of using that, that youth feedback, that family feedback to figure out what's next. And it's a little daunting, but it's, for me, those programs are not really focused on the numbers, which are super low, but it's that kind of really invaluable human connection that in big programs at the library, I just, we couldn't accomplish, we couldn't do those same things. So that's why I put opportunity on the word, um, the word cloud, because I, I, I feel like that's, for me, that's the focus is, is what are the opportunities here and how do we plan long-term based on what we're learning right now? And this is James uh, Adcox here from the King Community Library. And I just wanted to share a little bit too about Susan Jones' comment um, concerning um, digital fatigue and you know I think I, we have noticed it, our numbers kind of decline as the weather of course improved but even when school was done um, school in the sense of, of the homeschooling that was completed we saw that um, I think I think uh, I speculate anyway um, that parents might have been using some of our programming during the homeschooling time period and then when that ended uh, we did see some numbers kind of fall there um, and I know as a parent of younger boys, we, myself and my boys were digitally fatigued. We said we're doing a week without any, you know, once school was done, no more laptops. So I completely uh, get that and understand that. I, I was going to mention too that when we realized uh, at the Kenai Library, we realized that um, at least we, we commented that we aren't reinventing the wheel with, with programming and that if, if, um, 
young people wanted to see videos on how to do this or that or you know, whatever programs you might be offering, typically they can find one on YouTube or they can find one that is perhaps much better than the program we're offering uh, virtually. And so we, we kept thinking that we aren't reinventing the wheel, but what are we offering? Because there are a lot of great programs already out there that have been out there for years. Um, so we decided to invest a little bit of space and time and energy into uh, trying to boost the production value of our virtual program. So they, they seem a little engaged. They seem, they seem like we've taken time and energy into it. And, I, you know, I think uh, because of even some of the initial grab with, with just title and music and a little video editing, which we're very fortunate to have some staff here that, have, that love doing that. Um, and so I think it's offered a lot. And so when we, when we kind of look at some of the numbers, they've gone down, but we are seeing them start to go up again, and it's kind of exciting for us. So we feel like, at least with the summer reading program, um, we've even offered an incentive to watch um, some of our virtual programs, because typically we would be giving away prizes for summer reading. So now, if they watch all nine of our of our program videos, then there's a code word that they can solve, and they can enter to win a prize. That. So we kind of thought, well, that's a way to really kind of grab them too. So, and our numbers have gone up on that. So anyway, just wanted to comment on that. I'm going to um, echo it's Elizabeth again. Um, what what everyone has said. Um, Anic data, which is data from anecdotes and not real data. Um, when I went, when I went to my own daughter's Zoom classes, went from 24 kids in a Zoom class to seven by the end of the school year. And it's been gorgeous weather here in Anchorage, and I just don't think people are sitting in front of their screens. Um, we we joined Zoom classes all over the city, um, and as we at the end of the school year to promote summer reading and library services, and as we did, the teachers were telling us either we've had almost no kids for those last two weeks of Zoom classes, or we're finally getting kids back because we told them there'd be special guests. Um, so I think that burnout is a really big issue. Our numbers have fallen by half in the last month, which is why we are cutting down on our story time. Thank you. So one of the questions that I wanted to comment on was how to gather feedback, not just caregivers, but directly from children. So one of the things that we were preparing to launch immediately after spring break, which of course did not happen, were great big posters that we have made. Um, and they, you can use dry erase poster, you can use a laminated poster with a dry erase marker, or you can use a single use poster with stickers. And they had simple questions on them for caregivers that said that they could do on the way out of a program or a story time. And it said, because of today's program, I and they could put themselves on a spectrum, they could answer a question, they could just really quickly add a check mark. So we found that that's been really effective. People will happily add a check mark on their way out of a program. Um, and we had, we had pioneered some ones for little kids because um, we were looking mostly at story times and pre-literate kids. And one of them was like, my favorite part of story time is, and if you show it to the kids before they leave story time, you show them, do you like the books? And you have a picture of a book, the singing, you have a picture of a mouth with music notes coming out or the puppets, and you have a picture of a puppet, and then you give them a sticker, and they love to go vote for that. And that lets them feel like they're part of the evaluation process, as well as, um, and then you, the idea is to build that, and in later weeks, at, you know, ask them, hey, after you go to story time, what of this do you do at home? And then they can do that as well. And that's, of course, very little early literacy kids. None of this is possible right now. But we had a really good plan, y'all. <laughs> I don't know how to do that virtually. <laughs> I'm working on it. But Elizabeth, essentially everyone is doing that at home. <laughs> we are, but how do I like get them to put a sticker on a virtual board? <laughs> um, you you know, know, in the radio story time, we have the last five, 10 minutes or so is a kid call in. And that, in part just to give like a conversation starter i'll ask kids if they had a favorite book or if there was a favorite dance move because we have recorded music during the dance breaks um 
and it, it helps me kind of gauge what books kids like, but they're also very forthcoming in lots of details about their, their life. Um, but I, I, I kind of use that in the way that you're using, or you were trying to use that um, kind of sticker chart. And because I agree, that kind of information is really good, but we're kind of in this weird little spot where we need to kind of figure out some tools um, to do that. You know, the other piece that I've been trying to encourage, although I can't say it's super successful yet, is in these activity to go kits that we're circulating as part of curbside um, that change every two weeks. I've been encouraging families with a QR code to upload their finished products, either videos or uh, images to a couple padlets um, as a way for kind of an online gallery, a showcase, another way to engage with kids. And I can't, I can't say it's been super popular at this point, um, but I'm hoping over the summer there'll be a little more engagement, but kind of just, uh, it helps kind of get that data that Elizabeth's talking about, about, you know, what strikes a chord for people, um, who's, who's doing what, who's using what tools, um, yeah. Claudia, I really like that. So we have a library hashtag and we, on all of our program to go packets that we give out with curbside, we say, please upload a picture of your drawing or your family doing your experiment to our, and use our hashtag, but that depends on them having a social media, being willing to do that and having it unlocked in such a way that we could see it. So that, that you know, it's, we've gotten like two. Um, <laughs> So I really like the idea of a Padlet because it can be done more anonymously. I'm going to totally steal that. You're brilliant, Claudia. I'm not. I took to the Twitter sphere for feedback on tools, and it's it's actually really nice when you can set up three Padlets for free, and people with the QR code or the link they can be anonymous, or they can add their name. They can add. Um, kind of description text about what they load. They don't need to create an account like Flipgrid or anything like that. So um, it's a pretty cool platform. Yeah, I've used Padlet. Um, they use it to get book titles for Battle of the Books. Yeah. So that's what I'm familiar with it for. So yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I just want to be sure that, um, so there have been a couple questions in the chat box. I'm going to go back. There was a question earlier from uh, Martha Crow on based on what foundation. And um, Martha, if you have a mic, do you just want to expand on that question? You want to unmute yourself and, and share um, or let us know exactly what where that question came from? Here. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, I have. I'm an. I'm a librarian in the Yagi, our tribal library. Well, uh, we have very bad uh, internet action, uh, connection, so I'm not sure if this will work or not. Or we'll probably get dropped or something. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're here. Yeah. I'm just hi, Claudia. Yeah. Oh, Claudia. Oh, <laughs> uh, we have bad bad connection, so I'm not sure if we'll be making. You can hear us. Well, uh, Martha, we can hear you. Hi, Claudia. How are you? Good. I'm so glad to talk to you. I am too. I missed you. <laughs> I missed you too. And that's a life. Oh, it's my Claudia, it's Katya. I'm a librarian yeah. in our in our tribal library in Igyagig. I'm so glad. See, I'm this is new information that I didn't get to hear about because the library is closed. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we have our library in Yagik is open now. We can only have a, our maximum amount of people in here is eight people. 
and uh, out out of town, it's only for the residents that were open. Anyone from out of town is not not allowed in public buildings. Hmm. Oh, I had a question. My question was, oh, based on what foundation? Because. Last about last week or two weeks ago, I listened to a conference on equality in the library. You know, with all this unrest that's going on with our country, and then from the library conference, there was a man who, and I did not get his name, but he spoke about the values that. Uh, Library Foundation is based on is white supremacy based ideology of uh, foundation of the library. So I was uncertain about that, especially with colonization and social unrest that's going on in uh, Western society imposing or thinking that they were superior over indigenous races such as Igyagig, like where I'm from in my own village. You know, we grow up based on our education system was based on eradicating Aboriginal education or knowledge. And it's just mind boggling for me. And I'm not sure this is the right platform to for this on this subject. You know, um, there's been a lot of sharing um, on the listserv about this topic. And I know, Elizabeth, you mentioned it when you were talking about your philosophy about developing programs. So I think it is um, possibly the right form because whenever we're developing programs for our community members, we need to keep in mind, is this program, is it based on, am I developing a program based on my own biases that I think these people need for in this community? Have I actually involved the people? Have I reached out, invited them, and asked them? Have I worked with them to develop the program? Um, is it respectful? Is it inclusive? Is it accessible to everybody in the community? Um, am I creating barriers? Am I setting up the program at a time that a uh, working family can never attend? Am I requiring them, as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, does this activity require them to have these materials at home? Am I making an assumption that they have a computer and a great internet and all these school supplies and they can do this, this grab and go tip that I just put out there for them to take home? So I think, Martha, you bring up an extremely valid point. And I'll let the other panelists speak to it. Okay, thank you. You know, I think even beyond the, the type of program and the type of audience, I think even into how we're assessing programs and evaluating and keeping stats um, needs to be looked at when we're looking at institutional racism. Um, because, and I think this goes back to, you know, me in Homer or Martha in Igiagic or Elizabeth in Anchorage, understanding what community needs are and setting up evaluation based on those needs. We do have state reports to respond to, but I, I think assessment is really about understanding what our community needs and finding tools that over a long term create a picture about whether we're addressing our community needs with programs or resources um, or, or what have you. I think this is a fantastic topic. I'd actually love a whole other webinar where we just talked about this, because I think it's a really, really important topic. Um, and I think one of the important things when we look at white supremacy culture in librarians is that we've, we establish and maintain norms of behavior that are about middle class white culture. like. Please be quiet. Please stand in a line. Please do these and that things. Um, and we use materials and signage and books that reinforce all of those things. And if we don't create a culture of trust, I can have the best designed evaluation in the world. 
and people won't take it or they won't tell me the truth. I have not currently previously worked at a, a workplace where I didn't feel safe to give my opinion. So when they sent out a staff morale survey, I lied because I knew nothing would change and they didn't feel safe um, to give my opinion. And I really think that there's a ton of foundational work that we have to do in addition to our evaluation so that when we ask questions of the public, they will tell us the truth because they trust us to take that truth, that truth and make meaningful changes. And I don't know how to do all of that, but I'm trying and I want to try better. And um, this is Susan in Fairbanks, and I just want to um, echo a little bit of what Elizabeth said that, that um, sometimes the way our libraries operate are, are based on, on all these rules that aren't necessarily universal to um, every culture. You know, you have to do this and you need to do that, and um, um, it makes it, it, makes it um, hard for um, everyone to feel comfortable coming into the library and um, behaving in a natural way for them um, when it doesn't follow our standard rules. Unfortunately, I don't know how to solve the problem. But awareness is, is important. Okay, well, thank you very much, Martha, for that very thoughtful question. Um, there's another question in the chat box. Um, well, before I move on, is there anybody else who'd like to speak to what Martha um, asked? Is there anybody else in the group? Um, I'm Molly from Valdez. Um, and I think that it's important um, at this time also to kind of not just be thinking of like bigger picture of libraries, but also like what you like the ways that you like the biases and the things that you personally hold, um, because I think that that is like starting with yourself and like, an important um, and like necessary way to um, like a necessary first step before moving out into like an organizational culture. Um, and I think that it's also important, um, not just in regards to programming, but in, just in regards to our policies and even how we, even how we shelf our books, um, thinking about the ways in which the Dewey Decimal System um, in some ways kind of still promotes colonization. Um, so yeah, I think just in, can, and continuing to have these kind of, you know, maybe uncomfortable or difficult uh, conversations and not just stopping it when it's no longer in the news. Like this culture has been going on for like 400 years. So we need to continuously um, keep this in mind, not just when it's a hot button issue. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Okay. Um, there was a, a question from Kevin. Has anyone considered exit surveys to their websites? I'm learning about how to how to add them. So would any of the panelists like to speak to that question? This is um, Susan in Fairbanks, and um, so we're trying to take advantage of the fact that um, Beanstack. Um, when they sign up, um, they sign up with an email address. So. Um, we're trying to send out a weekly newsletter to, to um, after we all did and make it just for our local people, um, you know, giving them information about what's new and what's happening in the program. And um, I'm planning on for one of our last newsletters a link to just um, something as simple as you know Survey Monkey or something, um, and hopefully they will. Um, Respond to that. I'm not sure if they will or not, but um, we can only. Yeah. Kevin, are you talking about surveys linked to the library's website so that when they get ready to migrate away from the website, that there's like a quick survey that pops up? Oh, okay. I see your message about um, marketing surveys. 
Yeah, which is a little bit different than a survey. It's about the program. So Kevin and I work at both work here in Homer. So uh, maybe Elizabeth, I don't know if you guys are doing that up there in Anchorage. We are not. We have a we have a splash as it comes in on our website that tells you where we are with the state of the openings. Um, we have not tried an exit survey yet. Okay, we also had a question from um, Annie Thomas about what tools do you use to identify community needs? Anyone willing to share? This is Claudia. I'll just, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. I'll okay. Like I, say, <laughs> I always start with the people who've already gathered the data for me. Um, so I use our Anchorage School District has an open data dashboard that I'm on almost daily. I use the state testing results a lot from the um, Anchorage Peaks assessments, which of course did not happen this year, or the Alaska Peaks assessment, the Alaska Development Profile, so I can see how the incoming um, kindergartners were looking. Um, and that also, and the de demographic data is especially good from our Anchorage School District because that lets me kind of see which areas of town based off of neighborhood elementaries have which language groups really rising to the top um, or which areas of town are um, having a lot of kids registering as um, high need. Um, for example, recently, um, Girdwood is a community south of Anchorage and always very traditionally, it has not been high economic need but most of the people there are employed by the ski resort. And when that shut down, they all lost their jobs. And so that school's demographics have shifted drastically and they are now considered a high need, um, free and reduced price lunch school, um, which is changing probably the way we're gonna do some services. Um, so that's what we start with is the people who've already gathered the data for us. Um, we've also done a lot of community surveys um, set up tables at the grocery store to do community surveys and held open forums and things as well. Um, I'll chime in beyond what Elizabeth has talked about. Um, I I like to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people um, to get a sense of what individual grown-ups, in particular caregivers, are thinking. Um, talking to early childhood, early childhood um, and child care providers as another kind of touch point for, particularly in that case, a lot of families that we may not see um, during the day for story time. Um, right now, I have a survey going for a couple weeks as part of our weekly email, like Susan's doing a, a summer at HPL, um, talking to families that are in the program, actually talking to families in the grocery store um, when I'm out once a week, um, getting email feedback. Uh, so those are some of the ways that I'm doing that right now. It's, it's not perfect and it, it should be better. So if anybody has any ideas, um, I'd love to hear them. This isn't necessarily a, an idea of a, of a good plan, but so here in Fairbanks, um, in addition to what we were doing online, we um, created um, take home bags um, for people um, to support what we were doing online and um, provide additional activities and it was also in case people didn't have access to a computer and we were able to connect with them somehow, you know, maybe they called us and said, I wonder we had paper logs. So um, what we did, um, we made sure we tried to, to, to think, um, just as Elizabeth was mentioning, that we can't assume that, you know, everybody has craft supplies and stuff at home. So we try to put all that stuff in. So how are we going to get them to, to people? So uh, we have put up a little canopy outside. Um, the, the first week that we started, we were there every afternoon from 1 until 5.30, and now we've just do it two days a week. Um, 
and you know we're all masked up and we have the table and um, we would tell people that we had this bag for them and to stop by and, and pick it up and so we're not getting within six feet of them we're putting it on the table and they're reaching it but we still have the opportunity to sort of talk and interact with people um, which was great um, sometimes people just wanted to sort of take their bags but for me one of the things about summer reading that ha has seemed to be an issue is um, you know it, it was great that we were going to offer summer reading but until we had a way to get you know materials in whatever way to people um, then it's all great to promote reading when they don't have any books to read or any way to get access to a book um, so I would have a conversation with them you know here's three ways you can get booked from us um, and just having that one-on-one -on -one conversation um, was was very helpful um, because usually it would lead to other things um, other questions um, and the people who are just wondering by when our sign said um, SRP they're like what does SRP stand for and you have this whole conversation and are um, sort of educating just random members of the public who are walking by <laughs> um, so um, no, I know not everybody has the opportunity to do that but um, for us it was it was helpful um, when when I when I can't necessarily know if people are responding online or in, in any other way I at least am getting some direct anecdotal talk um, by conversing with them when they're right in front of me about six feet away okay well I, I'm just curious um, do we want to speak to a couple of these other questions um, for instance the audience when you're doing your evaluation um, who are you doing the evaluation for or is the question who is the audience who you are evaluating so uh, this is James again here from the Kenai Community Library I was just going to uh, comment on is who is the audience and who are you evaluating and one of the earlier questions was how do you evaluate maybe not the caregivers but the children that are participating so I, I uh, prior to, to COVID-19 I was running a uh, drawing class monthly um, and it it ranged from 12 kids to 30 kids and it was uh, it's a lot of fun I really loved it and uh, so at the end of every class um, I would ask them to give me a thumbs up if your drawing came out the way you wanted it give me a thumbs medium if it kind of did or give me a thumbs down if it looks like a tuna sandwich and then some kids <laughs> some kids started drawing tuna sandwiches to, to show me at the end and just being funny which i always appreciated but i would give a survey every now and then on you know are you learning these drawing skills is this helpful to you what kind of things would you like to draw in the future and you know i think it when we when i'm targeting my audience, which is a younger crowd, I'm going to say six to 12, I'll get some really silly answers that maybe are not taking the survey very seriously, but then others take it extremely seriously and offer amazing, you know, uh, feedback. So uh, that, and that was the paper survey, then I would log in uh, after I'd, I'd hand them a paper survey. Since COVID has happened, I haven't done any of that. So it's, I, I I actually was thinking about doing the thumbs up, thumbs down thing on Facebook, but then I realized thumbs down would not represent kind of what I wanted to represent. So I probably shouldn't do that. But uh, yeah, now is I think a little bit more difficult to get those kind of feedback. Well, I just want to pipe up uh, because what you said reminded me of something. There's a part of me that. Um, takes um, results of any kind of survey, no matter how well constructed, with a grain of salt. Um, uh, Elizabeth mentioned that she worked somewhere where basically she didn't feel comfortable and so she lied, you know, in, in responding to it. And I think sometimes people have a tendency, sometimes, not always, um, 
to tell you what they want you to hear, especially if you're in their vicinity. Um, uh, so um, there's a part of me that says um, that I'm going to look at the results um, uh, always um, with um, not with necessarily a critical eye, but um, not take every answer to everything um, literally because um, just my experience with statistics in, in a general sort of way, um, uh, you don't always know the full story. Um, you can make statistics tell any story you want it to tell if you provide only certain amount of information or other information or um, not the context of the information. So that's just one of my um, experiences with statistics. And I just want to share, if people haven't seen what Katie wrote in the chat, she said, Is there, uh, evaluation of virtual story time helped us realize that our target audience pre-K wasn't our whole audience. We found out that many adults with learning disabilities tune in as well. And this conversation was had at the grocery store. And Katie, you bring up a really great point that sometimes we don't always know who with the audience of our program, who's being served by the programming that we're delivering. Which is what I think so interesting about this time and kind of taking it as an opportunity because I, I have I have found this the same. And my daughter jokes about it. She's like, Mom, whenever we're out, people talk about story time. And it's it's often adults, I was getting a little paranoid that it was just older adults listening to story time. And still I, you know, which is part of the benefit of the call-in, but I also get emails um, and kids talking to me about it, but it is a, a very wide audience because people who listen on the radio are not tracked in any way. I have, I actually have no idea how many people are listening on the radio. I can get stats on live streaming um, which I get from the radio station every month, but those those uh, kind of anecdotal comments I get are are part of the picture that I am keeping. I am kind of capturing, and so I might be using a spreadsheet, but I have all of these little comments tagged to all these cells of numbers. So three kids call in, or I saw three people at the grocery store who commented about story time. Who can actually? reenact some of the movements that I talk about in story time. And so those are creating the picture. Now, Julie may not care about this when it comes to stats time, but it's it's helping me just like what you're talking about. It's it's understanding that maybe our audience is either different or much wider or smaller, depending on what we're doing. Thank you. And thank you. So I am going to go ahead and move this, if it's OK. I'm going to go ahead and move the slide. Um, because as Claudia mentioned, we, one of the things we did want to talk about was reporting requirements. So everyone who um, participates in the statewide summer reading program is familiar that we do require a, a summer reading report and evaluation. And just to, to let you know, I understand that this is the most unusual year. So um, we have we haven't changed the report very much. If you don't have numbers for some of the categories, just leave them blank. But we did add uh, one question about the statewide, um, the Alaska Summer Reading Challenge, um, the Beanstack, the statewide um, access to Beanstack. So if people could describe how they've been using that or not, um, that would be helpful for us for next year. Um, I also want to, speak, since I'm talking about Beanstack, I know there has been discussion about the emails. When people complete one of the challenges, they're getting these emails about go to your library and find out what your prize is. I'm very happy to report that that problem uh, should not be continue, continuing into the future. We removed those rewards that were attached to those completion badges, and so nobody should be getting that email any longer. So I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so Claire and, and Emma Murrah is our uh, interim grant uh, person right now uh, since Tracy retired. And she had a webinar where she was talking about some of the new questions that are going to be on the public library report. There's a couple that are um, probably related to, to youth services, and I've just listed them on here for you to know. 
I can share with you um, a PDF of, of all these questions. And, and um, if you're a library director at your library, this is something that you'll be having to respond to. But just keep in mind that all of these are um, yes and no answers, so you don't have to keep statistics on how many virtual programs that you delivered or how many recordings of programs you made available, okay? So any questions about the summer reading program report or evaluation or uh, these questions that have been added to the public library report? More than anything, it's just a, just let you help know, be in your radar. Um, the summer reading report and evaluation form, it's an online form and it is available now and it will be up until August 25th, okay? Okay, um, any additional questions or topics that you guys want to bring up since we have a few more minutes together about evaluation of your services? I was just going to mention, this is James from the Kenai Community Library, that um, that on top of Facebook, and we did really try and strategize about other ways of getting the material out here, out there. I, I love how Claudia is using the radio, um, and other, it seems like other libraries are using the radio, and that was one question I had. Are there other ways? We did start a YouTube uh, channel, and we feel like that's been helping more than just Facebook, but are there other ways that libraries are getting programs out there? Any of our panelists want to answer, Jenny? Or anybody else in the room here? I see, I see a reference to a story walk. Um, there is a question about how do people um, how do people evaluate those? Okay, well, um, that was quiet, so let's uh, go to the screen here. Um, I am very interested in, in future training topics or um, for planning future webinars, so if you guys would um, like to share with me um, what would be helpful, go um, training topics in the future, if you go to minty.com and put in that code 2838.82, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can see that. I had a question for people, and this could be an email conversation too, but my, my dog was barking at someone outside. But um, my question is this, I'm wondering, you know, here we are towards the end of June, and I'm wondering if people have, can articulate any decisions that they've made um, based on the information, the evaluation information they've already gathered in the last three months. Elizabeth was talking about shifting the number of virtual story times they're offering. Um, and James was talking about some of the different kinds of programming or incentives they offer. But I wondered if if anybody has made any other decisions based on the picture they've already created in three months. Okay, I'm having issues, so I'm going to try it again. And did anybody want to speak to what Claudia was sharing? It's hard for me to do more than one thing, I have to confess. <laughs> yeah. Susan's saying that, you know, things are changing so rapidly that so no decisions yet. Um, I totally appreciate that. It's evaluating and iterating on the fly. 
too hard. <laughs> okay. And I think Elizabeth is kind of, Katie's bringing up points about weather for sure. And Elizabeth, I think it's bringing up a point that I don't think we've talked about. We've been kind of focused on programming, but I think really broadening the picture is understanding, you know, what materials are circulating, how people are accessing um, resources that are not programming, um, which I think creates an even better picture for what community needs are, uh, which maybe all of their conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> I just typed this. So we have been really struggling with all of our services curbside. Um, and we open next week for limited services where you can kind of walk up to the lobby to pick up your holds. Um, and as we, we struggle with making sure we stay long enough in each section, each level of service to determine how it's working and how the public's reacting and how whatever we're doing is affecting the city's caseload. Um, and so we're really struggling to like try to spend at least two to three three weeks on something before we move to the next. You know, we've been three or weeks into curbside and into programs to go. So we're just starting to see some of that shape together. I think we're going to really hold off on like programs to go um, for a while to make those decisions. Um, and a lot of our decisions are going to be based off of July 21st. Our school board's going to announce what we're going to do for next year for the school district. And that's going to change everything about my world for the fall. And I don't feel capable of making plans in front of that decision. Um, I do feel good making the story time because at this point I have three months of data for story time virtually. Okay. Okay, well, we'll leave this up for another minute and then. Um... So some of the future training topics are uh, programs without internet, decolonize your youth services, online programs. So we have both, spec both the parts of the spectrum there, online program programs without internet. I'm not sure what to keep afterwards. And then I'm not sure about the insight. Um, maybe in the chat box, people can kind of expand on, on on what they mean by those topics. But this information is really helpful. It, you know, it's it's really great to find out from you guys what your needs, what your training needs are, or what your interests are for future training topics. And um, I will definitely be reaching out to the group <laughs> for future panelists. So if it's something that you'd, you'd feel comfortable doing, um, if there's some topic you'd prefer, uh, really like to share, um, you know, please reach out to me and let me know that you'd, you would like to be part of that. Okay, all right, I'm going to stop the sharing. And go to my last slide here. What people did in the chat. I will. I do capture the chat before we uh, end the program, and I can share that with you as well. I can also share the copy of the the PowerPoint if you're interested in that. So thanks again to our fantastic panelists. There are very good uh, folks here: um, Claudia Haynes, Elizabeth Nikolai, um, Susan Jones, and I'm sorry that Sarah Saxton wasn't able to join us. Um, and I want to thank all of you guys for for tuning in. And let's go back to, if you have any questions for our panelists, oops, you can always reach out to them as well. So. I want to say Annie is talking about doing these amazing things outside, and I really want to see pictures. So in case you didn't see my chat, Annie, can you please send mm -hmm. us a listserv or send a link to where you pictures? I'm so curious. Absolutely. And Daniel uh, Cornwall, um, is always looking for content for the Friday Bulletin. So if your library is doing some amazing thing and you want to share, um, you can always reach out to Dana Cornwall 
and um, give him a description of your program. And if you have a photo, he, um, he's often happy to include that as well. So thanks, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you all stay well. I'm going to stop the recording.